Awesome. Thank you so much, Elaine, for such a warm introduction. I want to start off my talk with something a little bit unusual. And to start off, I'm going to ask that everyone who is on their laptop or on their phone shut it off. If you've got an email that you're writing, if your boss is bugging you on a Sunday, he's a bad boss, but also close your laptop lid. Everyone, this is going to be great. If you're on a phone, make sure you turn it off as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a group breathing exercise to synchronize ourselves and to start off the day really well. So what I want everyone to do is to place both their feet on the floor, just a little bit apart. And you're going to place your hands on your thighs, palm down. And then you're going to close your eyes. Now what we're going to do is we're going to breathe in and count to three and breathe out and count down to one. So I'm gonna count with you and we're gonna try and see if we can all synchronize our breathing to the same pace. Are you ready? Let's go. Try and pace yourself with the person next to you. Pretty soon you're gonna feel the entire room breathing as one. Once we've reached that point, we're going to open our eyes. Stop breathing, you can put your hands to your side. And you can cross your legs or fiddle with them or all that fun stuff. Um, I think synchronized breathing is such an interesting exercise, um, especially when you do it with a group or a community of like-minded people. Because uh, so many times we can get our ideas in sync. Uh, we have opinions that might be in sync, but getting our bodies in sync is a completely different and interesting exercise. So thanks for doing that. And I encourage you to try that at any meetings you might have at work or if you run a meetup or organize another conference. It's a really fun thing to do. If you dedicate a lot of time to it, it can be really productive. But I'm not here to talk about breathing because hopefully you don't need to learn how to do that. I'm here to talk about running because I love running and I love programming. And when I started to think about what I wanted to share with you guys as a keynote, I realized that there were a lot of intersections between running and software. You know, I love software so much that I'm a little obsessed with it. Uh, I'm Captain Sophia on Twitter and GitHub. My GitHub is super important to me because I am one of the maintainers on Interact. Um, Interact is a desktop-based open source interactive computing environment. If you have no idea what that means or that combination of words seems really appealing to you, come talk to me after my keynote and I'll be sure to share. I'm also a contributor on the Jupyter project. So if you've ever used the Jupyter or IPython notebook, uh, some of the code in there is stuff I've written. Uh, I'm also the co-organizer of PyData Chicago. PyData Chicago is uh, part of the PyData Meetup Coalition. It's a group of people who are interested in the open source scientific Python ecosystem, and that tends to be the ecosystem that I work often in at the intersection of open source and Python and scientific computing. As a warning, this talk contains a lot of stock photos because I'm not a creative person, but hopefully you will enjoy it nonetheless. So let's talk about running. When I first started to run, I don't know what got me into it. It was just something that I wanted to take on on my own. So I went online and I downloaded a couch to 5K running program. It was this 10 week program that would take you from a couch potato, which is what I was, to somebody who could run consistently for 30 minutes. And it did that through this regimented plan that involved running and walking on certain days for certain distances or for certain time periods. And this plan was developed by an expert. So it was somebody who knew how the human body worked, how it responded to running, and what was the best way to push people, but also keep them at a good pace. And 
When I think back to my start with programming, I didn't have that same regiment. Um, I started off learning to code in Python by reading Zed Shaw's Learn Python the Hard Way. I was a really interesting and special case because I wanted to learn how to code in Python so I could build a search engine because that's what 14-year-olds who are bored on their summer vacation do. Um, and so I had a sense of what I wanted to do with my knowledge of Python. But nowadays, most people who dive into learning Python via book, via Code Academy, or other online sources reach this point where they ask a question, what now? They've learned the syntax of the Python programming language, but they don't really know how to put it to good use. They might have a problem that they're trying to solve or an application they have at work, but that transition from knowing the syntax of a language to using it to actually accomplish something or to solve a problem is kind of a big leap. And so I started thinking about how you can solve this gap that happens between knowing syntax and solving problems. And as I thought a bit about it, um, I think there's four more important points that we as a community kind of need to focus on. The first we're already pretty good at because we're all here and this conference is filled with lots of amazing speakers and it's giving back to the community, whether it's through teaching or writing blog posts. Um, giving back is really important and a way to share your knowledge with other people. And sometimes you also have to recognize that giving back might be something you have to do pro bono. For example, me organizing Pi Data Chicago is my form of giving back to the community. And I helped a ton of people get involved with open source or just accelerate their Python knowledge via the meetup, but I don't really get paid for that. And it takes a lot of time and energy from me, but that energy and time is multiplied when you look at the impact it has on all the people that I've helped. And I don't think the Python community has a problem with being generous and giving back their time. So we've got that down. What else do we need to focus on? I think we also need a diverse community of developers and experiences. And this is not just diversity in identity or personality. It's also diversity of thought and vision. And I think when a lot of people talk about diversity, uh, some people kind of tend to say, well, we don't need to focus on the diversity of people's identities or who they are. We just need diversity of thought. But so much of the way that we think is based entirely on who we are as people, on who we grew up with, on who our parents were, on that one gift that we got for Christmas that changed our lives forever, on where we went to school, on a professor that we met at a particular college that we got into. And so in a way, our identities are our thoughts. And when we have a diverse community of people who are different in their race and their gender, and their socioeconomic status, we can guarantee that we have a community of programmers who are diverse in the way that they see the world and think about software. And I think the Python community is definitely better at this than other communities. I'm also a member of the JavaScript community, and I think we got them beat there. So yay. Also, we don't have awful semicolons in our code. And this is another thing that I think is important, is to write about the developer experience and not just development. What do I mean when I say the developer experience? The developer experience is the learning process. It's how you go about learning to use a particular framework or understanding how a certain programming methodology works, instead of just writing about the framework or the methodology itself. And there's really two important reasons that we need to start writing less about our code and more about our experiences with code. Uh, the first is that it forces us, if we're an experienced developer, to be a bit more introspective about our learning process and our approach to software. And oftentimes, if you've been programming for a long time, you kind of stop critically thinking about how you're working and what you're doing. But writing about your experience can be a good way to solidify that and re-sharpen your focus on how you're learning. And I'm going to touch on that a bit further. And another reason I think it's important is for beginner developers. A lot of beginner developers will have no problem finding content on a particular framework or a particular programming methodology. but they don't have a lot of information about the developer experience of how you go about learning, of how you move from being a beginner 
to an advanced developer. And a really good example of this is my friend Adrienne Lowe, who's a member of the Django community. Uh, she transitioned from being a personal chef to a software engineer and cataloged her entire learning experience um, on her blog so that people can read about it and see what the transition from being a non-technical to a very technical person sounds like or looks like. So I encourage everyone to write about their own experiences. And how this relates to running, the first step that you take into a community really sets the stage for the next 10,000 that you take. So if you start off a run and your foot strike is poor, if the way that you're hitting the ground is poor, if your back is slouched, you're gonna have a hard time correcting that later on. Similarly, if you start off your developer journey with poor development practices or a poor learning process because you didn't know any better, you might have a hard time correcting that later on. And the reason I think people have a hard time correcting when they make mistakes is because sometimes it's hard to recognize failure. And running puts you in a very intimate position with failure. So after I finished my 10 week couch to 5K program, I felt like a total all-star because I was like running for 30 minutes and it wasn't even that good a pace, but I felt really proud of myself. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna totally like go crazy and go all out. So what I did, I downloaded a 18 week half marathon training program uh, from Hal Higdon's website. Hal Higdon is a lifelong marathoner. He's one of those people who's been running since they were like five years old. So super experienced runner. And I was like, this is a novice training program. I can definitely handle running this much. It's no big deal. As it turns out, the jump from a 5K to a half marathon is actually a pretty big one. So I ended up pushing myself too much and I would get injuries and I would like come out of breath after an eight mile run and I was feeling terrible about myself. But the thing is, I judged myself unfairly because I treated my failures as failures of who I was as a runner and as a person who was trying to change their lifestyle, not failures because I was just at a pace that was way too hard for me or way beyond me. And really this is important because recognizing failure means that you have to know yourself really well as a programmer and as a runner. One of the most interesting things about running, about people who run professionally, is the amount of self-awareness that they have. And most professional runners have coaches for a reason. Being a good runner, you need to focus on a lot of things as you run. You need to focus on your posture. You have to make sure your back is straight. You have to make sure that your arms aren't swinging too much so you're not expending energy on an unnecessary task. You have to make sure that your foot is hitting the ground properly. You also have to listen to the sound that your feet make when they hit the ground. If they're too loud, it's not a good thing. So you have to focus on all of these things. You have to be so aware of yourself and the place that you're in as you run. And runners who are really good at keeping awareness of their body as they run are some of the best runners in the world because they know how to pace themselves. I was like, I'm trying to build my self-awareness as a runner. I'm trying to be more aware of how I move in a space. But I didn't really have that in my tech career and the result was a lot of burnouts. I really didn't know who I wanted to be as an engineer, what I wanted to focus on in the open source world, what parts of open source I wanted to focus on. And as a result, I was taking on jobs and side projects and community organization efforts that really didn't align with where I wanted to go. And I ended up burning myself out. And I think we all need to have a particular self-awareness about who we are as engineers and where we want to go. If we had that, we would burn out much less. And to rephrase Sun Tzu, if you know your goal and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 syntax errors and all the other awful stuff that mentally wears on you as a developer. Um, I probably will go crazy after facing too many null pointer exceptions in Java when I was in high school. But in addition to recognizing what your goals are, you need to know when you need to push further beyond them. And it's this 
really interesting balance that you have to maintain. You have to be aware of yourself enough to know what you can handle, but you need to use that same self-awareness to understand how far you can push yourself beyond what you can handle. One of the biggest things that a runner has to balance is recognizing when they don't want to run anymore because their body physically cannot handle it, at which point you should stop running or your doctor will really hate you. Um, trust me, I know. Or situations in which they don't want to run anymore because their mind can't handle it. And you want to conquer the mind and kind of relax the body in those situations. And so this is a really tough balance that you have to make as a developer, as a runner. And then as a developer, you need to be able to know when you're comfortable in the particular framework that you're using or the library that you're working with or the programming language, um, and when you need to push further and expand your knowledge. And so in a way, programming and running both involve a strong sense of self-awareness and control. Uh, and I think that's what makes software and programming hard for a lot of people. You need to have a great amount of mental calmness and awareness to be able to write software and write software in a way that's productive for yourself uh, and for the environment that you're in. And self-awareness, also requires a strong awareness of privilege too. And this reminds me of an incident that happened um, when I was in Salt Lake City. I was going out for a run and I was walking home from my run. And I remember it was around sunset, it was getting a bit dark. And in the distance, I saw two figures laying down on the sidewalk. Uh, it looked to be a man and a woman. And I saw them in the distance, and immediately I was annoyed. And I said terrible things in my mind that I probably shouldn't have said in the moment. Because what I thought it was some couple or somebody who was high or drunk and being a complete nuisance to everybody else by laying down in the middle of a sidewalk that people were trying to walk on. And then I got closer, and I realized that it wasn't a couple. It was a mother and her son with Down syndrome who after playing with chalk the whole day had decided that he wanted to lay down on the sidewalk. And I felt so shameful. I felt that guilt that we all feel when we unfairly judge someone for a situation that we can't control. And in that moment, I was so aware of my privilege. Here I was existing in a world where I felt safe enough as a young woman to run out in the street right around sunset and not fear for my safety. Here I was in a position where I could leave work early because at that point I was working in my back porch remotely and go for a run whenever I wanted, whether it was the evening or the morning or the middle of the day. And this I think is kind of a modern, complexity to running. A lot of people will say that running is a self-contained sport, that it's so enjoyable because you don't need equipment um, or facilities to do it. But I think in our modern time, running is a sport of privilege. It requires you to have the time and the safety to feel okay running outside or indoors. And in a hectic and fast paced world where a lot of people don't have those privileges, running isn't really as liberating as it was. And so in a way I had an advantage and privilege that that little boy would never have. And in that moment I was struck by the differences that we all experienced. And I still think about it to this day because I think we all encounter moments when we realize just how good we have it. Um, and it's important to take those moments with us. And privilege translates directly to a concept that I hate in software. If you follow me on Twitter, which is Captain Sophia, you know that I talk about this all the time, which is the concept of rockstar developers and the unhealthy attitude around hero worship that we have in the tech community. I think a lot of people look at certain developers and see them as rockstar developers. There are no rockstar developers. There are just developers who have been given with the most elusive privilege of all, the privilege of luck. They ran into the right person at a conference. They fixed the right bug in a particular open source project. 
they went to the right school, they met the right professor, they just had it right at the right time. And unfortunately, not all of us are going to be lucky, but luck plays a really important part in who becomes a rock star and who doesn't. And stepping back from talking about individuals and so rock star developers, the most important thing about any activity is the community around it. And this is my favorite thing about, soft, about running. I call it the silent cult of the runners. There's this experience that you have when you're running along a path and you're alone or you think you're alone and you've zoned out into your music. And in the distance, you see another running, runner running towards you. And there's this moment of connection, of knowing that you're on a common journey with somebody else who's completely different from you. And it gives you a boost to wave at them or to nod as you run by, to know that somebody else is trying to do the same thing that you're doing. And I think the same thing exists in tech. We have the silent, or maybe not so silent, uh, cult of the programmers. And we all get that same boost of being around each other and knowing that there are other people who are on their developer journey. When we go to conferences, or if you've ever passed somebody in a coffee shop who you knew was a developer because they had way too many stickers on their laptop. That kind of community is really important because it provides fuel to us when we might not have it. It gives us the energy to push forward. I mentioned earlier that I work a lot in open source. Uh, open source is a very community-driven effort. It's really transparent. Um, it's all out there. You work with people in the open. You make lots of friends. It's fun. Everyone do it. Um, but at times, it can be very lonely. You might be sitting at your desk working on a pull request or writing a grant or writing a blog post for the project. And in that singular moment, it's hard to connect the work that you're doing with the impact that it's going to make. That's when you have to kind of lean into the community and rely on them. So I got this Twitter message from somebody a while back and it made me really happy. Uh, Cause for once I saw that the open source work that I was doing had an impact. Even if at times it felt like it was just me and a really annoying Git problem, which I have plenty of those, trust me. I think that kind of community is really important. And more, one of the most important aspects of community is working with developers who talk more about what they don't know than what they do know. And this is when I get alarmed because at some point people started calling me an expert on open source. I have no idea what I'm doing. I just started banging on a keyboard and somehow I'm here. And I try my best to talk more about what I don't know and a lot of the answers that are still, or a lot of the questions that are still left unanswered in the community that I'm in, than I do talking about what I do know. And one of the warning signs that I've kind of come across of developers that might be toxic to work with or non-productive to work with are developers who always talk about what they do know. And when I said that, you probably thought of somebody, right? And I think that's problematic because it shows two things. It's either that they're not willing to push themselves forward and learn more, or they're so self-indulgent that they can't admit what their failings are and what they don't know. Um, I really liked Raymond's talk yesterday because he talked so much about um, case studies of failures, of not knowing things. And that's how you know Raymond is a great developer because he talked more about what he didn't know than what he did know. You know what I don't know? How to run in 10 degree weather without freezing your ass off and hating yourself. That's a question I'm still trying to answer. Uh, so winter is coming up and in about, I think three weeks is when December starts. Um, I'll be starting my winter training program. Uh, during winter training, I do run outside because I'm an insane person. Um, whether it's snowing or hailing or like God knows what's going on outside because of climate change. I'm out there at 6 a.m. running. And it's a really interesting challenge because it's you against one of the most kind of basic human arch nemesis that ever existed, which is the environment, the elements, the weather. Um, 
As a reminder or a note to everybody, I live in Chicago, also known as the Windy City, also known as a terrible place, between December and March. Um, and I've already started to experience this kind of struggle of facing the elements right now into the year. Let me tell you, there is nothing that will like put you up against like the human characteristic of endurance than having to run southwest against a 30 mile per hour wind. I'm sorry I didn't convert that for the Canadians, but it was terrible. And as you might suspect, I don't have a lot holding me down. So it was, a t it was not a fun experience. But the thing is, when you run in extreme weather conditions, uh, whether it's extreme heat, extreme cold, very high altitudes, your body's going to struggle to, allo to accommodate to those different conditions, and your pace is naturally going to slow down. But when you are in that situation, you don't blame your slow pace on yourself. You recognize that it's because of the environment that you're in. Uh, and what I realized was that I couldn't translate that concept effectively into my career in tech. Whenever I existed in a workplace that was obviously hostile because I had an unsupportive manager or I had a coworker who just wasn't respecting me or my ideas, why did I blame myself for that if when I'm out on the trail running against a really strong wind, the wind is obviously at fault when I slow down? So I couldn't translate that into my career in tech. And I think it's really important for all of us to know when we're being hindered by ourselves and when we're being hindered by the environment that we're in. And it goes back to that self-awareness. I talked about the elements and I wanna talk about another interesting connection between programming and running. And it goes back to like the dawn of man. Sorry not to use that transition because people tend to hate it. My eighth grade English teacher did at least. Um, when humans first developed their large brains, the same large brains that allow us to write software um, and organize conferences like this, we required increased caloric intake to provide energy for that brain. And so we had to accommodate our food gathering techniques appropriately. And one of the techniques that emerged was a technique known as persistence running. One of the things that you need to know about humans is that we're not the strongest or fastest animals on the planet per se, but we are the most endurant and interestingly enough, we sweat really well. And so persistent running was a technique that was utilized by hunters where humans would run after game for long distances until the animal that they were running after would die of heat exhaustion because it couldn't sweat um, and maintain coolness as well as humans did in that heat. Uh, and then we would eat that animal and it would fuel our minds and then we would one day exist in a society that could somehow build a machine called a computer that could execute code um, that would change the world. And so I think this is really interesting because in a way, thinking and fueling the way you think are two of what I like to call primal obsessions. They're two of the most basic things that we can do as, and as humans. It's all about getting back to the basics of what it means to be a person. And I encourage everyone to try this. There is something so catharsic, um, so appealing about working through a really tough bug or a really hard programming challenge closing your laptop and then going out for a run or a bike ride, engaging in just like a really physically intensive human activity. Um, I think as tech workers, we exist in a society, um, in an ecosystem that always demands our attention, whether it's like our insane deployment Slack bots, which I saw a lot of at this conference, or like our bosses emailing us, our things crashing everywhere. We're constantly bombarded by technology, um, both because we build it, and because we use it so excessively. And sometimes it's good to shut all of that off and get to the basics of what it is to be a human being, which is to solve really hard problems using our magical human minds and to run really long distances. My plan is to convert everyone to a runner after this talk, so I hope I'm being effective. And 
getting back to the basics, running long distances, kind of shutting off all the noise around you can be a really uncomfortable process. And that's one of the things that's so great about it, is it forces you to get comfortable with discomfort. And that's translated so much into what I do in tech. Uh, open source can often be a series of uncomfortable circumstances, especially when you're a woman of color in the field. You have to deal with responses to pull requests that make you feel like maybe they were angry at you for more than just the way your code was written. Um, and managing that discomfort has been so much easier for me to do now that I've started running and managing the physical discomfort of being a long distance or a speed runner. You know what else is really uncomfortable? Strength training. This is one of the mistakes that I made when I first started running. Uh, when you run, it's all about increasing the efficiency of your body, how well you can utilize oxygen. And one of the mistakes that a lot of runners will make is not doing any strength training when they start to run. Strength training is really important because it builds muscles in your body. Um, having strong muscles prevents injuries when you run. It's the combination of strength training and long distance or speed running that makes runners successful. And that translates very well into tech. As I think we all find a particular subfield of the tech world that we all want to specialize in. Um, maybe you're really into data science or really into DevOps. And we get so comfortable in that particular subfield that we're in that we fail to step out of it and dive into something else. And I think a really good exercise for everyone to do is figure out what subfield you're in. Like maybe you work in DevOps, maybe you're a data scientist, uh, maybe you program with a particular framework. And try and learn something new, um, but not just anything new. Try and learn something that your coworkers or somebody on another team in your office is using and go through the experience of being a beginner in that particular area. And then try and train yourself in both things simultaneously. So you just become like a super powered engineer on both dimensions. And then when you do strength train when you run, um, one of the most important things that you have to do is keep good form. So I'm betting on the fact that most of you here have tried to do push-ups, yes? Okay, probably the wrong crowd to ask about push-ups. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever done any kind of workout or exercise, you know that one of the things that a trainer will tell you to do is to keep good form. And you've all experienced this, you're like getting ready to do, to do a push-up and you're like so into it, got your hands in a good position, your back is nice and straight, your feet are at the right position, you like do one push up, you're feeling like a total boss, you get down to do the next one, your back starts to sink a little, you realize, oh no, I've never actually done push ups before, maybe your back raises a little, and then you keep going, but your form is bad. You're not actually exercising any of the muscle groups that you need to exercise because you're not in the right position to get the most value out of that exercise. And when I started thinking about this, I realized that I suffered from a similar thing in the software world. Um, and it relates to my learning process. We all have situations where the way that we learn how to do something might be the least effective way to do it. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my guilty pleasures uh, is copying and pasting code from Stack Overflow without reading like the paragraphs of analysis and text that the person has put in and like poured their life into um, because I just need a code snippet and that's all I need. And that's an example of me having poor form. And that's an example of my learning process, my learning exercise, not really working out the muscle groups that I'm trying to work out because I'm not doing it right. And so if the way that you're learning isn't impactful, uh, if you're not taking the time to read the like lengthy analysis that somebody posted, then there's really no point in doing that. You need to kind of be very self-aware of how you're learning um, and when you need to stop uh, correct your form and then get back to it. 
And another thing that you learn when you strength train or do alternate exercise is the importance of slowness. If you've ever worked through a workout tape, let's see if I get a better response from workout tapes than I do from doing push-ups. Not really, okay. Um, so if you've ever worked out um, via workout tape um, or just online videos or anything, you'll notice that the trainer will oftentimes tell you to do an exercise really slowly. Uh, and if you've ever worked out and you've actually gone through and taken the time to work really th slowly through an exercise, you'll almost feel your muscles compressing and expanding and you'll feel them getting stronger. And I think this is really important to do in tech because uh, oftentimes software accelerates really rapidly. Um, I also belong to the JavaScript community, as I mentioned earlier, and they've got like a new framework or like a methodology out like every other Tuesday. Um, and so it's hard to keep up with that. But what I learned is it's not about absorbing things immediately as they come out. It's about taking time to synthesize the trends that are going on, understanding the problems that are, people are trying to solve, understanding the root cause of most things. Um, Engineers tend to do this thing where they'll like create a hundred different solutions to the same problem. Um, and when that happens, you get what happens in the JavaScript community, which is tons of frameworks coming out every other day. And what happens when, what you need to do when that happens is to focus on the root problem that they're all trying to address and to work through that one slowly and steadily. And that's how you get the most impact out of your learning experience. And that's kind of what I've learned in the brief amount of time that I had to share with you about how running and software intersect. Um, it's been a really interesting journey. There's kind of a long and winding trail of more runs and more insights into how running and software intersect for me. And I think if you took the time to focus on it, there would be a lot for you as well. Um, thanks for having me. You can go on my website, which is sophia.rocks for more info and good stuff. I have the best top level domain in the world. So there's that. Um, thanks to Women of Color in Tech and Flickr for the stock photos. I'm going to do the thing that uh, Tracy did and have like more good stuff after the thank you. Um, so just some stuff that I'm coming up um, working on and I think you might be interested in. I'm doing an open source live stream um, on Twitch of like how I work on Interact. Um, I did this because I posted a tweet that I don't have syntax highlighting turned on in Vim and people freaked out and were like, how do you even write code with no syntax highlighting? I will show you how I write code. So if you join me for the live stream and follow me on Twitter, um, it'll be really fun. Um, I'm also doing uh, getting involved with open source Q&A with CodeMentor.io. It's a webinar type thing where if you have any questions about open source and how you get into it, um, I'll help answer them. If you're really excited about what Raymond discussed yesterday and you kind of want to get more info, this is a good place to get that info. It's going to focus less on the tech side of getting started with open source. So I will be talking about how you get set or how you get your code editor set up. It'll be more focused on kind of the social and cultural introduction to open source. And then finally, I'm working with David Beasley to do a Python office hour series and a couple of other people. And so it's a one hour long office hour um, where you just get to ask us questions about Python um, and we'll answer them to the best of our abilities. Um, I'll, mine will focus on data science and data analytics with Python. So if that's something you're interested in, um, be sure to check out that link um, as the events come out. They are free, but they are limited to 20 people. So make sure you like track what events are announced and like register for them soon. Okay, now I'm actually done.